corn from Vietnam or Thailand. Kaya ganun ang ganun kalala ang yung sinasabi mong food chain. Ma mahirap or inefficient yung transportation. And ganun din sa mga vegetables. Saka sa, sa ano, yung loss and the inefficiency ay nasa value chain. Complicated talaga. Um, kaya magre-retire nag na lang si Dani saka magre-retire kami ni Prof. Borromeo in 3 years, mag import pa rin tayo. <laughs> yes, that. Ah, si, ano, ay, si, ay, baka may sasabihin pa si. Ah, okay, sige. <laughs> Tinuro nyo rin lang ako, magtuturo ako ngayon. <laughs> Kasi ka, kasasay ni din yung commodity team, so ni-revive natin yon. Tapos, uh, dinistribute namin sa lahat ng units para uh, to come on, vo on board kung sino yung mga experts sa bawat unit sa IWEP na mag-join doon sa commodity team. So, wala kaming sinet na limit ni din. Uh, I was telling din din ang dami, parang yung pinag- pin uh, pinadalang names ng bawat unit, dumami, ang dami ng member. And Dean was saying, oh, it's okay because uh, we cannot question these units. Uh, kung sino pinabinigay nilang, binoronteo nilang names, maybe these are really the, the people who should be working on these commodities. And uh, we welcome also the young, uh, the, we noticed na may mga bata doon sa binigay na names and Dean was uh, saying that, yes, because we should be mentoring. They should join the discussion starting with these uh, commodity teams. So ngayon ang sinasabi ko, Chersey! <laughs> Chair si John ng commodity team na yun. Dr. Laude ang chair namin. Ay, sa corn kaya si Ma'am Tonet? I think it is Joe. And I, I, that was in consultation with the ICRAPS director, ha? That the, the chair of the committees were done uh, with, uh, I consulted with the dean and also with the, si Ma'am Ed na kasi siya ang, ang co-chair ko sa, sa Ar Arnie. So, so ngayon, ang susunod na step is uh, the dean will be calling this. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah. We also invited other colleges. We'll invite other colleges. We will be inviting. But the next step is the dean, I think we should call this commodity teams and start. So they would, uh, you know, soon start the ball rolling by discussing all these uh, needs of each commodity. I'd like to share something because this is a little bit of history. Nung panahon ng Kastila, bag dumating ang mga... <laughs> Hindi, pasensya na kayo. Ako, ako pinakamatanda dito eh. Ang, ang, hindi. Si Susi, mas matanda ako dyan. 1914, okay, 1939 eh. Ang matanda pa. But, but the history is something like this. Uh, when we were students, kami ni Dr. Carpena, 1956, to form a team. Team na ha, team. Ang team noon, Dr. Mamikpik sa seed technology, Dr. Kebral sa plant pathology, si Abe Kawili sa irrigation, si Dr. Pegas sa weeds, si Dr. Uh, uh, Nanting Sanchez for entomology, si Dara at saka another one from economics. Kaya nagpum kami ng team. And we presented a proposal to the National Food Agriculture Council. And that time, at that time, huh, change rate was almost one is to two. I was able, or the group was able to get a fund for 250,000 pesos per year. Kaya team yun. So it don't, and after that, eh, of course, uh, history tells us that the teamwork really became very operational. So in about three years, we were able to come up with the vegetable stop gap recommendations in the Philippines, including varieties, including cultural practices, etc., etc. Kayon teamwork, it is very, very important. Pero siguro ang tanong ninyo ngayon ni, eh, bakit hanggang ngayon hindi pa tayo self-sufficient sa vegetables? O oh, maraming suliranin. And I think in similar manner, we have so many suliranian or problems in a number of activities that we do. And so one time in Taiwan, uh, attending a symposium, I asked the uh, very outstanding sociologist, I asked her, uh, uh, Ma'am, why do you think Taiwan is so progressive and successful? And the answer was something like this. Well, you know, uh, only two factors. 
our roles, the people's role and the government's roles. Um, people roles now, showing up, they are generally very industrious. They are very disciplined and they are very law-abiding citizens. Bahala na kayo mag-isip kung, ano, kung where we belong there. <laughs> and then sabi niya, and the government role. Number one, governance. Provide funds for research, development, and extension. So that this money can be used also for infrastructure development. Road uh, market to um, farm to market road, pagkatasi mga facilities, etc., etc. Pero sabi niya, finally, political will of our government to see to it that the laws are really uh, adapted or being followed. Political will. Isipin niyo, meron din siguro tayo ng support, support, no? So political will is very important. May political will pa tayo. Kaya hanggat ganyan tayo, hanggat ganyan din sa ating bansa, Ipatuloy pa itong magkagano tayo, reorganize, reorganize. Let us have a team. Pero yung team, kung hindi magtatawag together yan, wala rin mangyayari. So it is very important that if we say it is a team, hindi lip service. Yung talaga magtutulungan. Hindi pwede yung sira-sira ang kaliwat ka na nakatilikod na ka, oh, yun naman si kanunin ganyan eh. Well, you know how we are in the Philippines. I am sorry for being very truthful. Thank you very much. <laughs> on W737 Coconut Genetics and Genomics for Host Insect Resistance, may I call on Dr. Heidi M. Galvez. So uh, this is coconut genetics and genomics for host and sequence systems.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Sila ni Ma'am Connie and of course her staff. And we have of course our very own industry partner from Totin Coconut Authority and our uh, international collaborator who provided us the expertise in uh, bioinformatics and sequence analysis. So uh, just uh, to know, I, I'll just be presenting outputs from one of the eight component projects of the Coconut Genomics Program or Genomics Assisted Local Breeding of which this is five year and we are actually in our fifth year this year. So this is fully funded by uh, the PICARD, GRST. So just, uh, I know we know this uh, very well, but I don't want us, I'd like to focus on some very important aspects that most of the time, we just remember Bokupai and of course Makapuno, but down the line, there are so many, and Sir Tony, this is actually uh, from our early presentation, how many byproducts down the line that we are top exporters, and of course, the supplier of the byproducts. But of course, everyone would accept this is indeed a tree of life crop. Any part can be used, but we focus on the industrial uh, product that we are uh, showing you we are the first. <coughs> or top most uh, provider in the world. So world production industry, so looking at the total global production, Asia is actually by far the top producer. And in Asia, or Southeast Asia, we are now second after Indonesia. I couldn't recall when we were the top most uh, supplier, but for now <laughs> we are second uh, training after Indonesia. But yet, we are producing this much more or less annually with 24% actually producing to the world supply. But even though Indonesia is still the far supplier, I mean in terms of production, we are still the leading supplier, especially for coconut oil in the world market. So this is the uh, statistic uh, production as of uh, what, what's recorded in APO stat in 2016. So just again, uh, focusing on our coconut industry, of course, we are, the industry is providing as the fourth largest contributor to our uh, GVA in Philippine agriculture. But here is our major agriculture export product, coconuts, the byproduct, copra, copra, coconut oil. So this is in the uh, actual value. But note here, the stakeholders, including, of course, Guzbanyos, Bokupay, and others and our uh, Philippine Hybrid uh, Makapuno uh, program here uh, based at UPLP. But the number of farmers, farm workers, traders, different organizations, and the processors. Actually, we, are, we all have here in place uh, the tie-up of, of course, we should just maintain the good production, but down to the processors. So I guess this is the reason why we remain to be the top number one exporter of coconut, especially coconut oil. So again, here, just uh, showing you the traditional uh, products of coconut, but a lot of derived value-added products. And in the last five years, we have been contributing 94% of total export earnings, you see now, of just this average share in uh, monetary dollar value, in billion uh, dollar. But look here, even uh, you see the trend that in 2011, we have already been uh, exporting and increasing our export. And just recent, I got it as of last year, there is already a surge of 69%. And I guess this comes with the uh, coconut water and other added value that actually uh, just came from even in Robinson's. There is a coconut water already available and it is South Korea product. Uh, manufactured I'm still waiting to see in Robinson's or our normal market the, our own Philippine product, coconut water. But of course, we can always go backyard and get uh, that tree, so probably that's the reason. But it's just, uh, just this last weekend, I actually always took a photo of uh, Amy, of course, uh, contemporary friendships in coconut commercial. Then production here. So we all have actually three to six percent of our uh, farming, devoted to coconut farming. This is our plantation area, and uh, just, I guess, this has changed a bit, but 
that here we have this top five coconut oil regions, still the labor zone, but we know what happened after the devastation of uh, coconut sterilism. So, constraints, of course, never we forgot, we have forgotten, we have that old senile palms uh, in our plantation. So, this should be updated and we expect more uh, larger figure, but 14% need to be replanted. And we have always the devastation of calamities. And this is still the record as of the Uganda and uh, previous uh, typhoons. And since the project, the, the project I'll be uh, presenting is working on insect resistance, this is actually addressing the devastation on the drop of our production in Calabar Zone. That's one major area of uh, coconut production because of infestation of coconut scale insect. And tell you, it's not only in Calabar Zone, it's been spreading and including in Basilan uh, area. So, genetics and breeding. So, when we say genetics and breeding, first we need to know do we have resource materials to uh, venture and start doing research toward insect resistance. So, of course, uh, essential to have diverse varieties, breeding materials. And we have to know, of course, the cyclic uh, cycle and, of course, with the insect care. Luckily, we have our coconut gene bank. That's the reason we really strongly partner, actually our study leader, one of the study leaders is actually uh, our researcher, uh, Sir Mon Rivera, and of course, uh, Dr. Susan Rivera. They are part, and they, they are study leaders in this project from uh, PCA. And the aim that still remains to be the world's largest depository of coconut collection. And we actually, through this project, we have identified unique accessions and we actually already established it at ITB in one field uh, far back in Changka as initial uh, core collection of uh, duplicates from PCA. So this, the record of their accessions is still, uh, of course, uh, being increased as we have more collections. And these are the recommended hybrids and cultivar. So those PCA gene banks were our first genetic resource. Then second, during the outbreak of CSI in Calabar Zone, we have identified before there was the mitigation uh, protocol by PCA. Nakaikot na kami and we have identified seemingly survival, seemingly resistant or tolerant palms. And in Laguna and Katangas area, we have these uh, uh, specific locations in coordinates. We have identified only 13 and we have uh, we are continuously harvesting the seed nuts since we are running the host uh, resistance screening in the progeny. So we have this in IPB. And this is to validate whether the observed uh, seemingly resistant phenotype or resistance phenotype, there is genetics and we should see in the progeny. And then that's the second genetic resource. Then we have also, of course, uh, isolated germplasm in PCA albi. Tambulili. This is a Javanica coconut variety, which was reported as early as 1975 to have shown some level of resistance to scale insect in a limited host insect interaction assay. And also reported to have some resistance against Kadang Kadang. So we have this uh, PCA from Zamboanga, this survivor pumps, and uh, the Tambulili from PCA Albay. So this three are breeding materials. Now the insect pests. So of course, in genomics genetics, we know the, the plant material for breeding, then of course the insect pests. So this, very characterized, but the one that uh, have been observed to be predominant in outbreak areas is this species, Aspidius astridibus. So our entomologist group with Dr. Bambi has, and uh, Dr. Sison has well characterized including up to scanning electron microscopy for the easy pest. So of course, integrated pest management, this is how we would have most economical by integrating IPM and of course, host resistance. So we will be targeting for host insect resistance, the well-characterized uh, galatory trichomes for insect resistance. So you know we can have direct defense, mechanical, or induced defense cascading down to secondary tabulates. So we're doing biochemical analysis targeting this uh, putative and candidate secondary metabolites. 
So either, for example, terpenes, phenyl propenes, as in sugars and salt. So either direct or indirect plant effects. So uh, for for coconut, it is already reported and characterized. We have the type four gladiol trichome, and we have validated this in our this is already our current uh, capture. And this is the one we are screening in all the germplasms, the three germplasm I mentioned, PCA, the on-farm selections, and uh, our in both centers in Albay and Zamboanga PCA. So of course, there is also a very vast knowledge of database of all genes involved in plant glandular trichomes. So we access them, apply bioinformatics to market genomics to see the corresponding genes in coconut. And since we have already the coconut genome assembly, we have actually targeted the homologue of these genes in coconut. So of course, uh, we have the early release of the, the first release of genome draft of coconut, but we have also our local. We already have the genome sequence and have the database being used in our local uh, research. So ultimate goal to have research for insect resistance in coconut, genes tagging with sequence specific markers, and of course the plan that will can forward to the breeders. So again, this is just project A, one component project of the eight projects of the coconut genomics program, of which the other projects are helping projects 1, 8, 3, 4, 5, for all the assembly of markers derived from whole genome sequence and characterize uh, gene sequences, and of course, bioinformatics. So again, these other projects, so we are project A. There is still the kitchen mapping and marker development, and of course, down the line, the marker-assisted breeding with Dr. Nadinzi. So objectives, as we know, the database of coconut with the browsers and uh, with the genome sequence, the genes for insect resistance, and of course, the coconut materials. So this is the overall involving the different studies. So as we said, this is really a big project, IPB, we have IUF, we have from PCA, we have from STAT for the statistical analysis. So what we have accomplished, we have known the draft genome Katigan Dwarf, and so far, we are continuing that we have 9, 11 coconut genes for enzyme resistance. At least we have already 70 markers tagging the full length gene sequence. So this database is now big news. Parang window based na siya. Later, it will be available to public. Nakalink na rin yung markers, phenotype, and so on. So talagang yung big base na siya para hindi may rapan kagalit. Then the species of the CSI is characterized. And there is a marker with Dr. Bambi designed to, 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 that is specific to this species, which is the one uh, consistently identified to be predominant in outbreak areas. And of course, just ex example of how this, for example, two genes that we have mined their variation, point variation, in our germplasm. So, yung tatlong germplasm from PCA and our own farm selection. So in results, we have this uh, quality of our current genome sequence. We have already covered around 90% of the total coconut genome with this N50 of 570,000 cases as ample. So they are now ready, and this is the one actually we are mining for our, coconut, for our own project. So just show the initial insect resistance genes, and then we have found them, this, we have found them their exact genes in coconut. And then, diversity of our materials, since we have to show that there is genetics in the material, so we have to run total genome, just as is our diversity, as well phenotype trichome density in all these 93 coconut varieties. Have you studied this protocol for host resistance screening with our entomologist at IPP? And of course, mastery ring, and uh, pure, rigidus, and validated by molecular assay by Dr. Bambi Kawindi. And then, of course, we've conducted choice tests, host resistance screening, not only in UPLB, but as well in Pasila, and involving all the Zamboanga materials. And we have identified, for now, since we're still validating, we can tell that there are varieties that are least or most preferred by the 
CSI or by the ICF test. And of course, the controlled host resistance screening, no choice at UPLB, including Calabarzon uh, survivors and Zamboanga. And we have now, all in all, including uh, the choice and no choice, including the Zealand data, analyzed statistically with our partner uh, in Statistics Institute, Dr. Uh, uh, Rianio, we have at least 19 varieties now controlled and being validated at IPB. So in summary and conclusion, we have the coconut ingest threads generated by sequencing the whole genome DNA of the Eden Green Dwarf coconut variety using several sequencing platforms. So we use not only one sequencing platform because of the complexity of the genome of coconut. And then uh, we have also characterized the sequence of CSI and developed species-specific DNA marker system. Employing both choice and no-choice tests, we have characterized 73 core coconut trimplasm and on-farm outstanding selections for a resistance reaction against the ACF test. Now, we are mining the materials for point mutation by applying the T-Link technology based on genome sequence data, the candidate gene sequences. And that, we are associating, so statistics na naman napapasok, that differential uh, sequence variation to the differential response of these different materials against CSI. Through forward reverse genetics correlation analysis, we will be identifying the relevant sequence in coconut that would be our candidate host in resistance sequences of genes. Of course, we have to validate the mechanism and further elucidate once we have selected the coconut varieties. So, this is the current year. We are further annotating the genome sequence assembly. And now we are running RNA sequence data. So, may muna kasi kami, kasi ang unang problem, ano lang ang run for RNA analysis? Hindi pa alam, may resistant ba, mayroong bang susceptible. You need that for most, right? So, ang una muna niya nang minirun yung high throughput na phenotype screening. Then, we identified the most and least preferred. Now, we run, we are running the RNA-seq profile and whole genome or whole transcript analysis for all possible other metabolites beyond sa glandular trichome. Kasi yun yung may previous knowledge. So, magdagdag yan this year. Kaya, nasa na si Darlene, makakalbunan yung lalo. So, now, of course, uh, since the ultimate, the ultimate promise is to have this sequence database available to all researchers in coconut, nag-upisa na rin actually starting last year, part two ng deliverable namin sa PICARD, ituro na paano magagamit yung database na hindi kailangan yung black and white and bioinformatics na hardcore knowledge. And then of course, continue smiling. And we have, uh, uh, as part of the study and some thesis students, running the biochemical uh, analysis to validate the mechanism of resistance. And of course, our phase two, we have already uh, coming with, actually this is being evaluated now with Dr. Minjoro. We have the genome possible escaphold. Kailangan namin may ilagay sa actual chromosomes. So, papasok of course ang ating expert in uh, cytogenetics. And of course, uh, Dr. Kawili has just, I guess nakumpisa na rin to, more genomics characterization talaga ng CSI. Kasi dapat mag-abot yun, the host and the ACPS in actual genome, genome interaction. And of course, we have to continue the genetic mapping and association. And then as phase two, ito ang isang major problem bakit bumagsak kahit pa nandyan yung coconut. Kunting uh, dry spell, grabe yung drop ng productivity. So that has to be included in the phase two drought tolerance genes. And there are a lot known in the database. And we have found already, madali naman, nandiyan na yung sequence, nahanap na agad yung mga homologs sa kong With that, this, uh, I, I'm sure not all are here, but at least many of the cases are represented here. And thank you very much, of course, funding agency, Philippine Genome Center, as they are the one overseeing the fund from PICARD, and all our partners, and of course, UPLB. Good morning. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma'am Hai. So we can entertain two questions from the audience. Hello, hello. Ma'am si Ma Laude, of course, our uh -huh. first and still the consultant of Coconut. Sir Tony. Madal pa ang Si Ma'am Tony. Si Dr. Bambi, ayan. Si Check. 
Hello, hello. Hindi, hindi uh, specific sa project. Ano, ano lang, I just want to be, uh, paano ba yan? Uh, Ma'am, yung overview ba on how Genome Center uh, uh, works? Kasi it is a UP system, uh, ano di ba ma'am? So, paano lang, para lang ma malaman natin how it is. Uh, Well, um, you accomplished quite a lot no? um, with the um, mapping and everything. But um, we just wish to be clarified. Uh, did you get samples from Albay and brought it here? Okay. In the next house, and then just the early seedling manifestation. Dito kinadat sir. So sa yung kidnap dinadat, then dito the next crop. Then after mm -hmm. na tapos na yung na chubi na uh, lahat may dating all disposed as per. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, because yeah, that was our concern because it's uh, yeah, it's under quarantine. You cannot bring it here, no. So we were. Uh, good. Uh, Okay. Now, the, the next question, I wasn't clear on your presentation. So, did you establish really a, a, a clear between, uh, a relationship between um, insect resistance, CSI, to the trichomes? Uh, uh, it wasn't quite clear. What we have now, because of the generation, uh, it took at least one year to have the sprouts, then another second year to get the right seeding stage. Kasi nga seed nuts talaga yung dinala from, uh, from BCA, then pinagrow muna. So it's in third year na nag-umpisa kami. Currently, we have now the data, and we have early association already of the trichome data with markers and some genes. We are validating. We will wait for the actual phenotype in the progeny, since gusto namin talaga may genetics, then it's actually a lot of statistical association. That's why we're working closely with Dr. Riano. And then, kasi nga, five year, eh, kailangan sabay na rin, at dapat may data may bigay. Yung mga may signal na, may candidate, nirarana as another study yung biochemical analysis. 
targeting the metabolites. Uh, hindi ko na nailagay dito, but there are there is already uh, I'm excited to kasi si Sir Tony ang isang uh, aming major uh, as a thesis din to. Nakita namin yung profile variation ng specific metabolite between infected <coughs> and infected and the healthy uh, coconut. So all the rest by mid year puro yung data analysis ng association. Then magpin down towards the end of the year. Alin talaga yung strongly involved probable, baka hindi kami makahanap talaga ng resistance genes. But we know the host uh, genes or uh, sequences involved every time my insect uh, infestation. Kasi baka nga wala na existing. Then saka na yung proposal, how to reduce if ever you don't have natural high resistance. But at least we know the host factors. Kaya papasok yung phase 2 na project ni uh, Dr. Kawili, which is very important yung genome characterization din talaga ng metabolites. I hope, sir. So, sa ngayon, a lot data currently being uh, matched for data analysis. But what makes it easy now to mine, since we have our own genome sequence, whole genome sequence, and my RNA sequence data coming in, now within mid-year, magkaroon din ng whole transcript profile for the <coughs> spans ng coconut. Yes, of course, I said specifically. Okay, do you have it? Okay, well, I'm sure you're going to know. Thank you very much, Mom. Hi. May I call on again, Mom Joy Davios, Sir Miguel Yalan Dean Sobanco to award the certificate. So the College of Agriculture and Food Science would like to present the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Heidi Galvez for serving as a resource person uh, discussing uh, genomics on coconut. So given this March 7, 2018, uh, during the R&D Symposium of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, held here in Post Harvest Res uh, Training and Research Center. Signed, Dr. Labias, our Associate Dean for Research and Extension and Dean Sopanko. very much, Ma'am Hai. Okay. So previously we have rice and then followed by coconut. Now we have a new crop. This is dragon fruit. So may I call on Dr. Angelo C. Castro from PHTRC to present their work on physiological responses to low temperature conditioning and chitosan coating of red flesh dragon fruit. Yes, okay. So, good morning. I'm not a doctor, that's a mistake. Working, working. But uh, thank you all for uh, staying. And, um, I'm, and to be clear, I'm, I'm not a reporter. Right? And so, um, as a, uh, as, as a post-harvest major, and uh, one of our initiatives is to develop technologies that will improve the quality of horticultural crops. And one of that is uh, uh, dragon fruit, specifically the red flesh variety. So dragon fruit uh, belongs to the cactaceae family, meaning it's a cactus, it's a climbing cactus, and it is native in Mexico, Southern and Central America. And it was introduced uh, in Asia uh, through the French priest, actually in Indochina, and right now Indochina is actually Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And uh, the peel, if, if some of you are already familiar, uh, is leathery, and could, the color could range from red, pink, or yellow. And the pulp could be from red or white with tiny edible black seeds, with the texture of the pulp being similar to that of kiwi according to some, or watermelon, and the flavor is uh, slightly sweet. And according to studies and claims that it is rich in vitamin C, antioxidants, and fiber. And so dragon fruit has a lot of uses. So uh, commonly it is eaten as an intact fruit, 
And it can also be processed as spreads, preserves, jams, salads like this, okay? ice creams, beverages, and even as a dye because of the intense red color from uh, betalanes. And so, dragon fruit was introduced, believed to be introduced in the Philippines uh, during the uh, Manila Acapulco Galleon trade in, in 1565, during that time. And uh, one of the proof of that is a lot of these dragon fruit were grown in local homes as an ornamental crop, not as a fruit crop. And it gained the popularity in the market because of its, of its peculiar shape. It's scales, its color, and it is considered as a money crop. So if a lot of you will be going to markets or supermarkets, it is very pricey. So it is sold at about 120, 130 per kilo. So, so it, is a, it is high commercial value and it is high in antioxidants compared to, to be specific, to other subtropical fruits. So here's just a data of how uh, the dragon fruit industry in the Philippines is growing. So we, uh, it is shown here the increasing trend in the uh, land that is used for dragon fruit farming. And along with that, an increase, in an, an increase also in its production. So uh, dragon fruit, has three genera, the Hyrocereus, the Selenicereus, and the Epiphyllum. But under the genus Hyrocereus, in the Philippines, there are three common uh, species. And the, the very common is the Polyrhizus, having red peel and red flesh, and the Undatus, having red skin with white flesh. And the very uncommon, but according to a farmer uh, I talk with, that is developing this variety and it, it, it is soon to come out. So with yellow skin and white flesh. And for this study, I am working on with the red flesh variety because among Filipinos, this is the very common. Because according to them, because of its intense red color, it is more nutritious, I, unlike this. Because in, in Europe, they prefer the white flesh variety. So the challenges of the dragon fruit industry, there are a lot. So in production, there is uh, low yield, right? uh, pests and diseases, but, and also a lot of researchers uh, abroad or even here locally, they focus more on production. But as a post-harvest major, we're thinking, how can we address some of the problems uh, in post-harvest? And that includes short shelf lives, because dragon food has a short shelf life, even though it's stored at low temperatures. And that shows from other uh, reports that can, can just stay for about 17, 14 days, at 5 and 10 respectively. So, and that is because dragon fruit being a non uh, and being a non-climacteric fruit, uh, sorry, being a tropical fruit, it is very susceptible to chilling injuries. And that, and, and that shows, uh, and, and that chilling injury is manifested as, the fa as following, and translucency, of the flesh, softening, shriveling, etc. And another concern is its availability. So it's only available during dry months. That's why in type four, uh, uh, in type four climates, it's not a good crop to plant. So, so it's usually available from April to October and can extend to November to December, with the peak harvesting months being June and July. So to maintain food quality during storage at low temperatures, uh, actually, refrigeration or low temperature storage is uh, one of the common ways to, to lengthen. But because of chilling injury problems, I think we thought at that time that subjecting the food to acclimatization or conditioning of the fruit prior to its storage can alleviate that problem. And by applying an edible coating called kaitosan, we can supplement refrigeration and further uh, prolong its store storability. So what is LTC or, or low temperature conditioning? So as mentioned, it is just uh, acclimatization of the fruit to increase its tolerance to chilling injuries. And according to studies by Wang, uh, here, uh, here's what happens when a fruit these are studies for several fruits, not just for dragon fruit, but 
uh, it actually delays the symptoms of the injury that occurs after removal from the storage, and it elevates the antioxidant content and antioxidant enzyme activities, increases ascorbic ATP, reduces electrolyte leakage, and augments some carboxylase activities. And actually some, if I know some of you are familiar with this for the, the FA lymbiocentric pathway. So some is one of the intermediates. And if it, if it will be utilized by the some decarboxylase, by, by, by the some decarboxylase activities, it's availability for the uh, for the ethylene by synthetic pathway is reduced, therefore less production of ethylene that results to less uh, delay in deterioration. So for chitosan coating on the other on the other hand, it is uh, uh, an edible coating from uh, uh, from derived from the shells of crustaceans. And actually, what, what is isolated from crustaceans are chitin, and by chemically modifying it, like from from chitin to chitosan you are forming, uh, you, uh, by, by modifying it, you form chitosan, and it is in the form of flakes. But however, this one is costly. So, but we would just like to test this technology if it is effective in dragon fruit. So, for, for this uh, study, I, we, we procured dragon fruit from Indang Cavite, uh, from one of the largest owners of uh, dragon fruit farms, Mr. Eddie Silan. And uh, we, we brought the, those, uh, those fruits from Silang here at, to, to post-harvest. And then treatments were applied and subjected to physiological analysis. So more information about the procurement. The, the fruits, the maturity of the fruits after harvest uh, were, was, were about 25 days after flowering. And uh, ito si Mr. Silang, it is the farm from where, where I got the the dragon fruits, usually, of course, we will select good quality fruits with regular size of about 300 to 380 grams, placed in perforated polyethylene crates, as shown here, and transported to PHDRC, about 70 kilometers, in a air-conditioned van. So, usually, yung mga ano namin, dragon fruits. So, so, so what, what's brought to PHDRC? So, treatments were uh, applied. So the following uh, treatments, for example, low temperature conditioning, that's acclimatization for three days at 10 degrees. And another is uh, application or dipping the fruit in the coating, kytosan, 1%, dissolved in a slightly acidic solution of acetic acid. And a combination of, of kytosan and LTC and an untreated fruit. So you might be wondering why, why I chose three days at 10 and 1% kytosan because prior to this study, I already did two studies to optimize uh, which, which concentration of kytosan or with, uh, what temperature for conditioning will be used. So after treatments were applied, the fruits were stored at 8 degrees Celsius for six weeks and bi-weekly, meaning twice, uh, every, uh, twice a week, there, so sorry, twice, sorry, twice a month. Okay, so there will be a withdrawal of the fruits, and uh, and then it will be placed in uh, in a uh, another uh, cold room with a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So that 20 degrees Celsius, that post storage, is to simulate the supermarket temperatures uh, when they are uh, for, for for fruits. So until, and, it, and the fruits were observed for quality changes until it reaches the limit of marketability. So here are the following uh, physiological anal analysis that uh, done. So weekly in storage at, at eight, actually supposed to be five because in literature in Vietnam and also in other countries, they use five as the optimum uh, temperature for storage of dragon fruit. However, by taking all the data from uh, the temperature data from the uh, from the cold room, it averaged about eight. Okay, so during that time, hindi pa maayos yung cold room ng ano <laughs> ng post harvest. Okay, but thankfully now it's okay. So weekly storage and also daily during post storage at twenty, respiration rate and ethylene production were measured, and by weekly in storage and and at fruits limit of marketability, okay, uh, 
the following were determined. ACC, concentration in the flesh, phenolic content, antioxidant activity, and electrolyte leakage, which is a direct measure of occurrence of chilling injuries. So, so for the results of this experiment, uh, for the respiration rate, uh, uh, you may be all be familiar with how, this, how it is done, but, uh, but a 1 ml of headspace gas coming from these respiration jars uh, are injected in a gas chromatograph that is fitted with a thermal conductivity detector and uh, that we get, from that we get the, uh, the, the, res the respiration rate. So during storage, okay, uh, we can, uh, that's, there was a reduced in respiration rate from 68. This was initially determined after harvest, directly after harvest. It started with 68 degrees, uh, sorry, 68 milligrams of carbon dioxide per kilogram of the fruit per hour. Uh, to about 18 to 28 milligrams CO2 kilogram per hour when it was uh, after one week right, of storage at 8 degrees Celsius. So that decline in, uh, in, in the rate of respiration was actually due to the uh, inactivation of the enzymes at, the, at very low temperature. However, you, uh, you can observe that there was an increase in the respiration rate on the third week and probably uh, that may be a, uh, an early onset of chilling injuries. So which will be explained later on that, uh, because it was corroborated also by um, uh, by the ethylene production. So, and from here, coated fruit, we, uh, co the fruit coated with 1% kytosan had the lowest rate of respiration. And that only says a lot about the, the gas diffusion regulation of, of the coating. So meaning, if it is coated, the internal oxygen diminishes and an increase in, in carbon dioxide concentration internally. And because of that low oxygen concentration, respiration, is reduced, well, was reduced. So the control, on the other hand, had the highest rate of respiration. So, so during post storage, I've shown here the respiration rate for fruits that were withdrawn on, withdrawn on the second, fourth, and sixth week. So as uh, as, as you can see here, there was a there there was an increase in the respiration rate after immediate removal from storage. So that means there is a resumption of the enzyme activities. That's why uh, respiration increase. But as the days go by, it doesn't matter what week it's from, okay, there, there was a decline in respiration rate. And that, can be, and, and that decline in respiration rate was actually a res, uh, uh, the depletion of the substrates. And so it's the start of the senescence of the fruit. So next, another is ethylene production. Same method done for, for respiration rate. However, the detector for that is different. It is FID or flame ionization detector. So ethylene is uh, a colorless, odorless, uh, gaseous phytohormone that is, that is responsible for a lot, of uh, a lot of physiological processes. And most of them are most of them, but not all of them, are deteriorative. So, so, so here in storage, um, we can see here that ethylene production was at minimum for the first two weeks of storage. However, similar to respiration, a third week, there was an increase. So that itself is, an er again, is an early symptom of chilling injury, even without the physical manifestation of the injury. So, LTC, the blue curve, may have reduced the inherent effects of temperature, change, temperature changes, as claimed by Wang, that probably it augmented the, some decarboxylase activities, thus reducing the, the rate of ethylene production. And during post-storage, post -har uh, sorry, during post storage, similar trend was observed. The rate of, of ethylene production upon removal also increased because of resumption of the uh, uh, of, of, enzyme, of enzyme, uh, enzyme activities and due to utilization of, uh, because of senescence through time, uh, uh, ethylene production declined. So, so another, uh, another result is the concentration of ACC. 
So why did we look at ACC? It's because it is an intermediate in the ethylene bisynthetic, bisynthetic pathway. It could, be an er it could also be a gauge of genetic injury because at low temperatures, we're expecting that all, uh, that all, that, that, by, that metabolic activities are halted or at least slowed down. So if these metabolic activities are slowed down, maybe some of the substrates get accumulated. And, and that in the case, for example, ACC, ACC oxidase is be, at low temperatures, it is being, uh, it's inactivated low temperatures, that's what it can accumulate. Accumulation of ACC could also mean uh, an early gauge of chilling injuries. So, so with that, uh, we can just show here that 1% chycosan coating uh, uh, coated fruits relatively have a higher ACC concentration. Why is that so? It's supposed to, it's supposed to, uh, to, 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 uh, re to, re to reduce the fat, okay, yung ACC. However, going back to this, the conversion of ACC to ethylene requires oxygen. And for coated fruits, there's a, a reduction in oxygen concentration. And that is why you cannot expect it to have a, it, it will usually accumulate in the flesh. So, so for, for the, in the pulp, usually there's no change. However, it is noticeable that the control have higher ACC concentration. Now for electrolyte leakage, okay, so, um, I'm sorry, I'm already time, time's up, but I'm the last presenter, so <laughs> I'll just go all the way. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Sarah, then. But the electrolyte leakage okay, um, is an actual measure of chilling injury. So, so by measuring the changes, in, uh, in, electro in electrical conductivity before and after lysis of the cell. Basically, just a percentage of the, of the uh, of electrical conductivity. Um, we can determine how much of the, uh, of the cell undergone chilling injury. Because um, in, in, when you look at the cell, it is uh, protected by the cellular membrane. But at very low temperatures, the membrane permeability is compromised. So it becomes light, it opens up, so the contents leak out. So when contents leak out, they become readily, readily available for, for, for enzyme action, and that results to increase in uh, metabolic activities like respiration, ethylene, and it deteriorates because of faster rates of those metabolic activities. So, so electrolyte leakage will measure that so according to this, during storage, there was an increasing uh, rate of, uh, there was an increase in electrolyte leakage as the fruits uh, prolonged storage at, at, uh, at 8 degrees Celsius. However, it was higher for the fruits that are, in, uh, that, that are untreated. So according to this, that LTC and 1% kytosan uh, improved the cell membrane integrity, thus preventing the leakage of cell contents. So at limited marketability, actually no changes for treated foods, but for, for control, it has a higher uh, electrolyte leakage during post-storage. And then next, sorry, last two analyses. But for total phenolic content, we want to determine if total phenolic contents, content actually is enhanced by these treatments. Because phenolic contents, they usually have uh, antioxidant activities. And, this, and they can fight against free radicals that are formed. And these radicals usually have a, a role in the degradation of the cell membrane in chilling, uh, during chilling injury. So according to this, actually, no, actually they're all the same. Uh, it is not affected by the treatments. So, and also during its, uh, during at limit of market at post-storage, actually uh, there was a decline observed. But, but not shown here. Then lastly, the antioxidant activity done using DPPH assay. So, so according to this, fruits subjected to LTC in 1% kytosan had the highest antioxidant activity while the control fruit had, had the lowest. So, and with that, we have concluded, basically, we're just looking at the response. We're not trying to, to say which one is the best treatment, but it's up to, to, to other researchers or other students 
um, to, to choose which treatments would they like to, uh, to pursue. Uh, so the early onset of chilling injury was pronounced in control food as manifested by higher rate of respiration, ethylene production, and electrolyte leakage. With a, and also, Kaitosan quoted single treatment alone, yeah, alone was more effective than conditioning with or without Kaitosan in alleviating chilling injury as exhibited by low respiration, ethylene production during storage at 8 and post storage at 20. And electrolyte leakage was lower in Kaitosan and LTC treated com uh, uh, and treatment combination and combination of those treatment, treatments would suggest their effectivity in alleviating chilling injury as well. Although treatments had no effect on total phenolic content, uh, anyway, but 1% kytosan fruits showed an enhanced an, an antioxidant activity. So with that, that is the result of, the, uh, of, of one of our studies done at Cost Harvest. So I would like to thank the uh, my advisor, uh, Dr. Elda Siguera, and also my uh, scholarship during that time when I did this at USD for, for the support for the money. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir, Protasha. Thank you. Wala, walang nagtatanong kasi eh. <laughs> uh, well, congratulations. You know, I, I'm, work, I'm teaching the stress physiology course. And, you know, maybe I should invite you to present this. <laughs> uh, but um, one thing that my question is actually, the, the Kaitusan is, um, one of my graduate students is studying Kaitusan, but he's, she's trying to see if it, it has a plant growth regulatory properties. And in some literature it has. So in this case, uh, what, what do you ascribe the effect of kaitosan? Is it, uh, is it like a PGR or just basically a physical coating? Basically, it's just, uh, the application of kaitosan is basically a physical coating to uh, modify the, gas, the internal gas composition. So as of right now, uh, we don't have uh, that proof yet mm. uh, for, uh, for the, the plant regulatory uh, Ability of for now. So maybe, sir, in, uh, in other uh, researches, you can investigate that. Okay. Yes. Questions, Papa? Yes, sir, Melvin. Uh, may question lang ako kasi, limbawa, uh, lahat sila ay cold storage, di ba yung treatment mo? Uh, bakit di mo din nagdaga na, limbawa, room temperature o kaya heated ng konti? Kasi tropical fruit siya, di ba? Yes, sir. So as mentioned a while ago, this, is what, this was already a third experiment. So we already did the first phase where we have different temperatures. We actually have ambient and then a, a conditioning temps, several of them. And what, uh, what we use here in this, in, in this study was already the optimum uh, conditioning temperature. So that's why it was not included. So and also in connection with what Dr. Potasio asked, other than just physically um, regulating the, the, the diffusion of gas, actually, Kytosan also has an antimicrobial property. Mm -hmm. yes. so, so that also helps uh, uh, during storage, yung mga formation of molds ay, or attack by bacteria, it would also be helpful. Did you conduct any palliative evaluation after the termination of the experiment? Not yet, sir. Not yet, oh. Pakakain pa ba kaya? Oh. Pwede pang kainin? <laughs> Pwede pa naman. Edible pa kaya? We have not done sensory evaluation yet, but, um, but we are really stopping the conduct of experiment when it reaches the limit of marketability. So, ah, okay. so we, have, we have set quality requirements mm -hmm. uh, before the experiment is terminated. So we are assuming that the fruit are still edible after uh, 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 during post-storage. Okay. Yes, ma'am, El. Uh, Edna. My question is more on the practical side. For how long can you store it under your best treatment? And about how much will it cost, uh, additional cost uh, for the 
uh, for the storage treatment. Thank you. Uh, we have not the costing, but it can last for about uh, one month or, or less. Siguro 25 days. And I think if we can, ex that, that's our problem. We, we still have a project in post harvest that involves rabbit food. And we are exploring other technologies. If we can, if, if, if we can uh, somehow uh, push its uh, uh, post harvest life about one month, that would be very good, especially for export. Because, uh, in, in, for example, because right now, uh, Vietnam is the largest uh, producer and exporter of, 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 of dragon fruit. And it would take about a month to, uh, to export this. So if we can uh, extend that, that would be big. But for this experiment, if only the best, uh, I think it could last about one month or so, or, so, or less. Unlike the unlike previous uh, studies that could last for only two weeks, okay. two weeks or like that, two, okay. two weeks. Okay, meron pa pong tanong? Wala na po. Okay. Thank you very much, Angelo. May we request uh, Associate Dean Labios, Dr. Villarreal, and Dean Sopanco to present the certificate. So, I'd like to present the certificate of appreciation to. Mr. Angelo C. Castro for serving as a resource person on uh, physiological responses to low temperature conditioning and chitosan coating of red flesh dragon fruit. Uh, presented its March 7, 2018 at Post Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center in connection with the R&D Symposium of the College of Agriculture. Signed by Dr. Jocelyn Labias, our Associate Dean for Research and Extension and Dean Enrico Pisopanco of the College of Agriculture and Food Science. Congratulations, sir. So at this point, we'd like to call on Dr. Labios for some messages. <laughs> Thank you lang po. Uh, bago po mag-close ang aming uh, kasama sa research committee na si Lilian, I would like to grab this opportunity uh, to thank Pwede na sigurong pa-thank you <laughs> kasi two days na ang magand, medyo maganda yung naging resulta ng ating symposium. So at this point, uh, I wish to thank the many colleagues in the college who we had the most gracious opportunity to work with. <laughs> at mag-demand <laughs> pero kanya yan okay and uh, Dr. Dormi Del Carmen and her posters committee in the PHTRC and ICRAPS please stand Dormi and if there's any in your committee or here so hanggang mamaya po uh, busy sila Dr. Lil Colliado and her food committee from IFST ay nasa labas si Lil nag-aasikaso her committee is composed of uh, colleagues from IFST and ICRAPS also and Doc, Mr. Mel, Melvin Ebuenga, and Jodel Padilla, and their documentation and media committee from NCPC. And Mr. Andy Loresco, wala dito si Andy, and his finance, ways, and means committee, committee from D3, IAS, and ASI. I'm so grateful that Andy does, does the most stressful work in our, in our group, but with always a smile on his face. He's constantly harassed by me and by Ma'am Lillian through email, text, and uh, person uh, when we meet, but he never showed it. Uh, may honorary page din na siya sa fundraising after this symposium. Uh, Dr. Weng Ocampo, who cannot be with us kasi meron siyang uh, family emergency. Uh, she has the physical arrangement committee from IPB. Yung kanyang, siya yung our majorette. But even if she's not here, she's so generous and she's ready to jump to help, to jump up to help when we panic about funds. <laughs> and then, of course, Prop Lilian. Prop Lilian, who did some magician moves last weekend. 
with her proceedings <laughs> with her group at IPB. Uh, she almost gave me a heart attack because <laughs> I was so anxious about the proceedings. And of course, Dr. Hil Villancho, nasan si Hil, and his secretariat and registrations committee, in addition to his health in, men, in the Ways and Means Committee. And of course, the dean for his leadership, full trust, support, and encouragement, and how he lets us use the dean's office for meetings, and he also feeds, at, feeds us all the time. <laughs> My favorite ladies and gentlemen at the dean's office, who help in various ways, always a reassuring bunch. And last but not the least is Catherine, our assistant in chief. Uh, textmate, arranger, compiler, sabi nga, kinocompose ko palang ay naklik and send na ni Catherine. Ganun siya kabilis kumilos. So, thank you very much. And uh, may, meron po bukas kaya. Bukas ko na po naman ite thank yung ating marami pong donors na nakuna natin ng financial support for this symposium. Thank you, ma'am. So, at this point, I'd like to call Prof. Lillian Patenia, the chair of the Papers Committee for the Tax Symposium for to formally close our event for today. Just today. Good lunch. Seven institutes and two centers. Kaya tip lang ng iceberg yung mga present ngayon din eh, sa dami ng output natin. So I hope we can expand the ano the presentation. Kasi ang sabi nga ng steering committee sa dami ng presentations all over the world. World na tayo ha. Hindi tayo nakaka kita-kita o nagkakaalaman. So, this is the only way of telling everybody at the our College of Agriculture and Food Science na ipagmalaki yung ating mga uh, achievements. Kung makikita niyo yung mga posters, pili-pili yung mga posters na yon. Ang sabi namin, yung mga best posters ang kung pwede ilagay doon. So, I hope we can invite all our people to view the uh, tawag nito, the posters, and we, I hope then we can prepare for next year so we can improve on what we have done. I think this is the first time that the college uh, started this R&D symposium. Thank you, Dean, for uh, starting all this, and the team for uh, putting together. I think we are I know, successful in this. And then uh, we thank Ang tawag namin, nasa si Pa Mama? Malis na yata. Ah! <laughs> Ang tawag namin kay, ano, kay Pops ay si Pa Mama. Bakit? PMM kasi siya niyo. O, ang moral of the lesson, ang yung scientist daw ngayon, magkakapera na because of CTEE. Na inumbisihan ni nung Vice Chancellor pa si Ding Supanko. Ano, sir? So, ang sabi ni Pa Mama, it took them 13 years of research and eight years bago they started the patenting at in 2008. And then eight years bago nila nakuha yon. And magkano ang lifespan ng, ano, ng patent? Um, 20 years. So mag expire na yun ng 2027. Kaya sir, kailangan natin ano, humanap ng paggamit ng ano, para maging billionaire ngayon. Pamama and the team. <laughs> Kasi right now, billionaire pa lang siya eh. <laughs> so, ang goal natin, maging billionaire ang scientist. Kaya ngayon, swerte ang reps because we have two tracks already. Yung scientist career track, ay kung gusto mo ng faculty, yun yung science career, I mean, merong scientist honorific, yun ay pera. <laughs> well, anyway, ang reps ngayon, kung gusto mong, they have choices. Pwede kang mag-faculty kung gusto mo, or kung gusto mo, maging scientist. In fact, ang scientist one, ng level nun, professor one. Tapos, ang dami pang ano, perks ng scientist. Ano, sir? Si Dr. Villarreal lang ano? Number one, pwede kang pumunta sa ibang bansa once a year if you represent a paper. Kailangan na-accept yung paper. 
Number two. Sir, harap ka naman. Ha? Ayaw mo humarap. Likod ang nakikita mo so, sa inyo. Sa oh, sige, sir. Okay. <laughs> You can see your voice. It's a scientific paper. You can also subscribe to a journal of your choice. Isa lang yun. Mati here. Tapos meron kang Manya Carta. Manya Carta. Manya Carta. Manya Carta. In fact, Lolit is very rich. Naku, i-announce ko. Lolit Valencia, sir. Oo, the opportunity to attend all National Academy of Science and Technology activity in the country. Or in the Philippines. You know, at saka nga, yung level ng salary mo, I wish you okay. Diba ko, may kinaging scientist pa, ang equivalent yun yan sa sekretary niya. Kaya nga, sir. Kaya talaga yung ibang state universities, nagpag-convert na sila ng kanilang item from faculty to reps. I know of one, two, or three. Thank you, sir, for the info. Kaya ang reps, ang kalaban nyo, sarili nyo. Because ang, 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 ang feeling nyo, you have all the outputs already to apply for a scientist one. All you have to do is submit all the documents. Ano, sir? Number two, ang ganda-ganda na lang pa yung data mo, hindi mo sinasummarize. At pagkabigay ng application, hindi ka nagsasubmit. So everything begins with you. Tandaan ninyo, nakisimula sa inyo. Kapag ka hindi kayo kaminos, hindi naman gagawin ng boyfriend team nyo. Hindi. hindi gagawin ng tatay nyo, hindi nyo gagawin ng nanay nyo. Kayo lamang ang gagawin. Tama, sir. Kaya sa IPB, tatlo yung nasa ano, nakasalang. And hopefully, uh, many more are coming. So, it's an incentive talaga sa reps na, ay, nako, kaya nyo... Yung... Yes. O, yun daw. 100%. And you don't need to wait for promotion. So, kung mag-submit na kayo ng credentials nyo to the DOST, si Sir Olet. Napakasabi na rin ito sa Mendoza, if there is interest, pagbibigay kami ng seminar on how to apply for that. O oh, sige sir, schedule natin para maliwanagan ng husto ang reps. Kasi ngayon talagang may choice. Nung panahon namin, wala kaming choice. Oo. Ang, nung panahon namin hanggang UR5. Pag after UR5, nandun na kami sa Red Brigade. Oh, member pa si ano, <laughs> by si Din Rico doon sa mga Red Brigade. So ngayon talaga, ang kalaban ninyo ay kalaban ng reps ay sarili. All we need to do is produce output. So today, ang na-present natin ay dalawang hybrid. Kasi si Pamama at si Heidi ay crafts at saka yung ano, uh, IPB. Kaya magkatulong yan eh. Ang position nila ay faculty but they conduct the research at IPB. Yung output ni Pamama sa kanyang ginawa sa IPB. So ang moral of the lesson, kasama niya yung team, sila Tony, etc. So, importante na ma-recognize, ma-patent. And hindi lang, you can patent varieties, technologies, etc. All we have to do is get in touch with UPLB, CTTE. Ito namang si, ano, si Asi, si Asi, si Nestor, germplasm naman. So, use of Gabing Fernando, Gabing Fernando as food and feed. So, hindi lang tinatakal nila yung pagkain ng tao, pagkain pati ng hayop. Okay. Si John naman ay tumanda na kasi six, <laughs> buti wala si John, no? Sabi ko nga, six decades na pala yung rice program. O, oh, six decades since the 1960s. And they have produced more than 40 varieties. But in the last three years, they produce six So, ibig sabihin, you can produce two varieties per year. Kaya challenge yun sa reps, to produce two papers per year. ba? Diba? So, if the breeders can produce six varieties in three years, eh dapat ang reps makaproduce ng two publications per year. Yun din ang sabi ni Dr. Javier. Reps should produce at least two publications per year. 
eh, kailangan natin palakpakan. Saan, saan yung si Aling Maliit? Si Aling Maliit, ang tawag namin kay, ano, kay Heidi. Siya yung ano, nanay ngayon ng coconut after kay Mother Cell, si, ano, si Dr. Ramirez. And sumunod kay Dr. Ramirez na Mother Cell, si Manang Rights. Anyway, sumusunod na itong si Heidi. So they're doing a good job. And ang minamay nila, hindi gold eh. They're mining genes for insect resistance. So her group is doing a good job on coconut genomics and um, uh, for uh, and understanding the mechanism of host insect resistance. And last but not the least, itong how do we prevent losses from post-harvest? Ito na yung PHTRC. Angelo Castro, not the journalist. Mukhang famous itong si Angelo Castro. Eh. Nasaan ka, Angelo? <laughs> Ayan doon. <laughs> Ang kilala kasi namin, yung matandang Angelo Castro. Ano, sir? Panahon natin na namatay na. <laughs> anyway, PHTRC is doing a good job on studying the science of post-harvest uh, uh, losses at saka yung paano mapreventa. Anyway, so this is for now, closing our program. And thank you everybody for bearing with us for the last... Uh, three days. Thank you very much. Just a short announcement. The, there will be an opening of our poster exhibits at the Ash Lobby uh, this afternoon at 1.30. So everyone is invited. Please tag along or bring along a friend to look at the posters. Sa Agronomy Sauce and Horticulture Lobby po tayo. Thank you very much.